All right, so uh, our panel is Robot Shark Laser, what hackerspaces do. We don't actually have any robots, sharks, or lasers. We have a laser. We have a laser. I know, it's sad. We do have a laser, but it's not like a big. We do have a ducky. We also have a Lee, a Noid, a Nick, and a Steve, which is infinitely better, I promise. Well, all right, maybe not better than a laser. <laughs> but it's awesome. Uh, hmm. What is a hackerspace? How many people here, by a show of hands, are involved in a local hackerspace, makerspace, DIY group? Oh, wow, awesome. That is great. So, like, more than half the room. That is great, awesome. So, you guys know what your hackerspace or space is. Um, one of the goals of this panel is to show you what everybody else's hackerspace is like, or at least a diverse sample. Uh, hackerspace is a physical forum. It's a, a place in the reality space where we meet and collaborate on projects. Um, it's a place where we develop a community and also foster a community that already exists. Um, it's a place to do DIY stuff, to have uh, ownership or access to the technology, uh, to make our own projects, and to hopefully develop new technologies. Um, there's a lot that has come before us, hackerspace-wise. Uh, some references are there. What else would we like to say about what a hackerspace is? Does anybody want to jump in? Yeah. Okay. Well, largely, it's basically, it's the place where all of our stuff is that we want to build as a group. I mean, that's the main purpose of our hackerspace is that we like to get together, collaborate on projects. And a lot of it comes out of a raw physical need, too. There's some of us that live in apartments. Um, I have a house, but it's got no driveway or garage. So if I got to fire up the angle grinder, I don't really have a place to do it. It's like a library for things. Yes. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> Okay, on our panel, if you don't already know, which I think you should, but I didn't, so I can't judge, uh, is Lee. She is from Hack Lab in Toronto, Canada. There's Noid, raise your hand, uh, from the Black Lodge in Seattle. And then we have Nick Farr from Hack DC in Washington, DC. And Steve Clement from Syndicate in Luxembourg. And of course, Beth from Freeside in Atlanta. Thank you, Lee. Oh, awesome. Apparently, we have some Atlantans in the audience. Who knew? Okay. Oops, sorry. Oh, I'd like to uh, make a point about our panel. I tried to be as diverse as I could, and I failed. And the reason why is uh, we asked for volunteers from other countries who were coming to DEF CON and who were, would want to represent their hackerspace to be on our panel. Uh, unfortunately, either no one from uh, South America, Africa, or Asia was coming to DEF CON that was involved in hackerspace, or they're shy. I don't know, but our panel is pretty diverse otherwise. We have Canada, we have Europe representing, and we have all sides of the U.S. except Texas. <laughs> But it is important to note that there are active hackerspaces projects on every continent except Antarctica which I think is pretty, pretty wicked. Mm -hmm. And how long is that going to last? I mean, we'll be there soon, I'm sure. <laughs> that, and if you look at some of the stuff that's going in on in Antarctica, it is almost hackerspace-like. I know, right? Yeah. So nothing but research going on down there. Um, OK, we're going to go down the panel, and everyone's going to talk a little bit about themselves and what kind of hackerspace they're involved in. Um, I'll go first, because I'm near the mic, and I have the clicker. I'm Beth from Freeside. We're in Atlanta, Georgia. We are brand spanking new. We just got our physical space, yay, after an arduous voting process that seemed to never end. And we're very excited about that. We basically completed one project that I couldn't even present on. That's how like uh, new we are. We just finished our RFID access. Thank you, uh, Casey and DMC Morris and Ducky. And um, this is our logo has a barcode. Uh, we're a nonprofit. We were started by a couple guys from Columbus who moved to Atlanta to uh, work for a big company there. And uh, DC44, a local DEF CON group, showed up at the meetings. And uh, 
various other local groups then started to uh, donate members, shall we say, to our cause, and that includes our Atlanta Linux enthusiasts, Perlmongers, Dorkbot, the Arduino group, the 2600, on and on. Um, six months ago is when we started. We have 50 members already, and we've actually had to cap that. We have had way more requests for membership than we can handle at this time. Um, we do, however, encourage people to come by and participate in what we're doing and what's going on, whether they're a member or not. Uh, as far as rules for our space, so far it's a work in progress. We've stolen the core values and beliefs from MindSpring, which was an Atlanta ISP. Uh, we have a hackerspace manifesto developed by one of our own, Eater, and uh, we have some safety rules like don't be an ass, use the safety classes. Um, and that pretty much sums up what we're doing. Here's some links. They'll be in the published info uh, and they'll be available online. Oh, this is a picture of where we're located. All of that? <laughs> it's all ours, no. <laughs> you tell me. Ducky wants me to tell you that we have 5,500 square feet of rocking ass warehouse in Atlanta, Georgia that is solely devoted to hacking. All right, so there you go. <laughs> Thank you. The floor is yours, Noy. Hey, first off, how many people in here are Twin Peaks fans? Yeah. <laughs> so you guys are getting this, right? The Bookhouse Boys patch? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm Noid, as previously stated. I'm with the Black Lodge out of Seattle, Washington. Technically, it's in Kirkland, Washington. It's on the other side of the lake, but people don't know where the hell Kirkland is. So. Um, we started um, just about a year ago. Uh, we ended up getting a place. A uh, buddy of ours was living in this little house that's actually in an industrial area and butts up against some train tracks. So it was kind of, it's funny, you're in the middle of Kirkland, yet you feel like you're in the backwoods when you're in this place. Um, our nearest neighbors are a four-story building full of web developers. And we can pretty much get away with whatever we want. When he decided to move into a proper house, we decided to take over the rent on it. Um, and right now, we have eight primary members. Uh, we don't work like a lot of the other spaces seem to, where there's a, a large general membership. We have a small kind of board of directors, and then it's oh, just open to everybody else who wants to come in. Uh, we didn't want to end up with you know 100 people trying to make decisions. We figured we'd keep it small. Um, right now, this number actually changed since these slides got set in. We actually have nine primary members now. Uh, myself, uh, Luna and Vidiot, who are actually working right now, Sybin, our buddy Londo, who just got off work, The Dark Tangent, um, who doesn't show up as often as he should, but <laughs> <laughs> still involved. Yeah, I don't know if DT's in the room or not. Um, I just like giving him hell for it. Um, we've also picked up uh, Don Ankney, who's actually sitting here in the front row. Uh, co-worker of ours as well as a co-worker of Luna's and another co-worker of me and Don's. So, websites blacklodge.org. We keep redesigning it, letting it sit, and then redesigning it again. Um, we've reached that point where, you know, web development's not really your thing, but you're the guy that knows a lot about computers, so people ask you to do it, and you eventually get to the point where you just get tired of doing websites for people, even yourself. Um, and mostly what we do is hardware hacking. Uh, a lot of us are gearheads too, so we're doing a lot of metalworking. Uh, we're getting into foundry work. Uh, Don likes to do a lot of coding. Uh, Brian actually plays his drums there because it's out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, you know we're into ham radio, beer brewing, all kinds of crazy stuff, and a lot of working on our cars, uh, which has got us into some trouble lately. But I won't bother going into that. <laughs> so why do we do it? Like I said earlier, none of us had garages or any place to go work on stuff. I have a tool bench in my basement, and half the tools I need to use would light my house on fire. So I had to get it someplace else. Um, we all have a ton of tools. Uh, Vidiot himself had a machine shop, and then when his brother-in-law passed away, got his. So we have two machine shops in addition to all of the rest of our tools. On top of that, too, like I'd been in charge of the DC-206 meeting for a couple of years, and all we ended up having to do was sort of wander around looking for a place for the DEF CON group to meet. We'd find a cool place and then the business would go out of business. You know, we'd find another cool place and something would happen to, you know, we wouldn't be able to use it anymore. And I thought, you know, it'd be really cool if we have a place where we can actually do talks on a regular basis and have a regular meeting place that's not a library where people are telling us to be quiet. You know, like, like she said earlier, what was it? A, it's a library for things. 
Yeah, it's a library for things where you can make noise. <laughs> so, and we wanted to do our part for the community. Um, you know, Seattle is interesting because there's actually two hacker spaces. Uh, there's the HackerBot Lab folks, if any of them are in here. Uh, they're actually down south of downtown Seattle. And they've got all kinds of crazy stuff going on, and we got our space, so now there's east side and west side up in Seattle. Um, am I running long? A little bit, we're all doing that. Okay. So basically, yeah, um, the now nine of us pay our bills out of the pocket. Uh, we've got keys to the place. Um, the general membership doesn't get keys, but they come over when the place is open. Um, or if you wanted to have it open for something special, say you know you got a Linux user group or a robotics group needs a place to meet, yeah, I'm more than happy to come down and unlock the door as are everybody else who's got a key. And then we have our monthly board meetings where we sit down and figure out you know how far off are we on our bills, that kind of thing. So uh, I'm Lee from Hack Lab TO. Uh, two, uh, probably all three of the founders are in the room. I see one there, and I don't know if Seth can wave as well. Paul is there. Seth seems to be asleep still. Um, we're in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We were founded last July. Um, we're actually up to 30 members. These slides are outdated. Uh, and we have an 800 square foot around loft space in Kensington Market, which is a really cool downtown neighborhood in Toronto. Um, there's a bakery next door and a bar underneath us. So it, it's, it's a really convenient look. Oh, and two 24 hour streetcar tracks. So it's like 24 hour transit, it's right downtown, it's super convenient. We have a really, really active IRC channel on Freenode. I think everybody's sort of given up on the idea of setting up their own IRC servers and is just using Freenode <laughs> um, for, uh, for hackerspaces. And uh, we post a lot of project stuff to our blog at hacklab.to. Um, we're an incorporated nonprofit in Ontario, which is a pretty easy thing to do. And so we have some, you know, institutional sort of rules, like a set of formal bylaws. If you go to hacklab.to slash bylaws, you can check those, those out. Um, and we also have stuff like, in terms of how we sort of organize the space, we have a hardware donation policy that was one of the early things that we had to think about. Um, unlike some of the spaces that have a, a huge amount of physical space, we have a pretty small, like it's, it's only a little bit bigger than my apartment. Um, and so we've had to be pretty careful about like not just filling up with stuff. So early, very early on we decided no CRTs. And that actually, like th that was a big deal. So uh, I think I might have one more. Oh, no, it's Hack DC. I'll pass that along. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lee. Um, Hack DC uh, is an incorporated nonprofit in the District of Columbia. Um, we started out uh, just a little, a couple months after the first Hackers on a Plane, a um, little more than a year and a half ago. Uh, we all, you know, it was me and, a, and Eric Michaud and a couple of people actually didn't live in DC, but we had a strong relationship and we were all willing to get, um, we were willing to throw down personal money to get a hackerspace going in DC. Uh, we started out pretty much using the hackerspace design patterns. We reached out to the Dorkbot community. We reached out to burners in our community. We reached out to Linux users groups and just slowly started selling people on the idea of having a hackerspace uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, a little while um, after we started doing that, maybe two or three months, uh, and lots of intensive searching on Craigslist, we found a really awesome space in the Columbia Heights neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Uh, we signed a lease. Uh, basically put an announcement out there, said, hey, Hack DC is open for business, and we went from an empty room to a room full of uh, lots of shop equipment and cool things we could trade for more shop equipment in an afternoon. We just said, hey, you know, we're having a parts party, bring down things that you think uh, the community might need, and the community came out and supported us. Um, we're primarily funded by member donations. Uh, the current dues is $50 a month. Um, there's, we, our membership hovers around 30. Uh, Washington DC itself um, is a city where there's lots of people coming in, lots of people going out, so there's a reasonably high member turnover in Washington DC, but we keep it around 30 members and have a good time. Our big signature event, if you're ever in Washington DC on a Monday night, please stop by uh, Hack DC um, and take part in our microcontroller Mondays um, event. That's really cool and we, it's, the place is always packed. Um, we only have an 800 square foot um, actual workshop and then we have another um, 600 square foot uh, it's also a workshop, but it's more designed for you know woodworking, metalworking, that sort of thing. We use it for storage. The primary space is used primarily for classroom and electronic sorts of things. And um, our last rule, yeah, okay. And our last rule is, you know, we, we like to. We're in Washington D.C. We're relatively political people. We like to write rules, then forget about them, then rescind the rules and rewrite them. And eventually, I think the standard operating rule now is don't act in a way that would make us 
create a new rule. And people are pretty good about that. And another noise bridge phrased this another way, and I like the way they phrased it. Um, you know, their guiding principle is be excellent to each other. And I think that's something that's critical for a hackerspace to succeed. Hi, I'm Steve from Luxembourg. Luxembourg is a small country uh, in the middle of Europe. We are bordered by um, Germany, France, and uh, Belgium. Our population is 490,000 people, so that uh, might give you a laugh. It's not a lot, but there is definitely a purpose for a uh, hackerspace even in a small country. Uh, currently, we have 25 mem members, um, out of which five members are hardcore members that actually uh, get things going. Um, we had issues with a lot of leechers that just wanted to sit around and do nothing. So what we decided is make more projects and get people uh, more involved. Currently, uh, we have no membership uh, fee because uh, we don't really have a space yet. Um, the problem is that mobility is key. Basically, the rent is that tremendously expensive in Luxembourg that we can't afford it because we can't, we can't pay the rent. And um, all, all the spaces that are free, they are government, uh, governmently owned. And if you tell them, hey, we are a hacker space and we want to uh, take p things apart, they, they don't really trust you. So what we did is um, we took all our stuff and crammed it into a van. And now we just go on the mobile tour. So we, we have a mobile hacker space if you want to. Um, so even if you, if you are scared of starting a ha hacker space, don't. You just do it mobile. Um, there you see us at the Hackerspace Fest in Paris where we took all our stuff uh, with us and we, we just served the local community there on that conference with a, with a mobile hacker, uh, Hackspace where you could just uh, solder stuff and, and we had pliers, we had everything you uh, just needed. Um, so yeah, that's all from us. Thanks guys. Um, we're going to talk about projects and I'd like to just preface it by saying please hold questions until the end and we'll have a little bit of Q&A time at the end and everybody can participate and I hope you will. Lee. We're also going to go to the breakout room after if people just wanna either ask further questions or just sort of talk shop about hackerspaces in general. And that'll be Capri 106. Okay, let's talk about projects. Freeside, as I mentioned, just finished their very first project which was an RFID access project. They didn't finish it in time for me to do the wonderful presentation that I would like to do on it, so you'll have to just keep up with us online and, and check out all our awesome pictures there. So I'm going to hand it over to our fabulous panel because they are awesome and they've been in business a little longer than us. <laughs> I actually want to check that out too because we're looking to do something similar. She, Lee actually is the one that inspired us when Taylor went to Canada and saw what they had. He was like, we have to do this. So well, and the source code for our system, well, I'll talk about yeah, well, we might have to make a road trip to Toronto then. Okay, so what the hell are we doing over at the Black Lodge? There we go. Um, we're lighting things on fire. Um, it's here for fire. Uh, in fact, actually, that was an attempt to uh, slag a bunch of hard drives with some thermite. That was uh, both of which was generously donated by DT. That's data Scott Moulton can't even recover. <laughs> Yeah, I'll bring it for the forensics talk next year. Um, forensics challenge contest. <laughs> uh, that's uh, me brewing beer uh, a few weeks ago. Actually, no, probably about God, about two months ago now. Uh, we've got everything. So we've been brewing for a while, but we're really set up for it now. We can actually move everything outside. Uh, have a nice little table set up. We got a good covered porch, so regardless of what the weather's like up in Washington, we can uh, pretty much cook whenever we want. Uh, I'd say we got a good 40 gallons of beer ready to drink or in bottles aging right now. Um, the gun up there, that happened to be a project uh, Londo's got going on where he's had a real thing about steampunk and has been taking and making all sorts of weird steampunk weapons. Uh, this is actually now mounted to a board like a trophy. <laughs> uh, and then some of the other projects we've been working on, um, we've been kind of decorating the place a lot lately. Uh, I don't know where the Mr. Wizard chemistry set came from, but it's awesome because that's not retro, it's just that old. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, we had a big Halloween party. That was kind of our grand opening. We threw this huge Halloween party, invited everybody over to, out to it, and, you know, fire up with grill. Uh, we do a lot of social stuff there, too. We have the monthly DC206 meeting there. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be having a DEF CON decompression party over there because we got a ton of space where people can just hang out and have fun. 
Um, I don't know if we can be as noisy as HBL, because you guys are kind of next to nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we can get pretty loud, so it's going to be a lot of fun. And then we've got some future projects we're kind of trying to kick off. In fact, DEF CON got in the way of a couple of them. Um, currently working on a uh, propane foundry. It was supposed to have been done a few weeks ago, but not having my car for a weekend because it was in the shop really thwarted me on getting 60 pounds of refractory clay. Uh, I thought about biking it, but I realized that wasn't going to happen. So um, horology, Vidiot's really into horology, and it's not what you think it is. <laughs> Does anybody know what horology is? I can show you later. <laughs> <laughs> it's watchmaking. It's watchmaking. Vidiot puts together these very intricate pocket watches that are overly engineered. They just look cool. Um, a number of us are working on a virtualization lab. We've got some pretty beefy hardware that I've been able to pick up through my Dell Preferred account. Uh, greatly reduced rates so we can stack up the rack. In fact, we have a full-size rack um, sitting in the server room right now. Um, more beer making. And we're getting our metal shop set up. We actually have a table we've got to finish building off, but we've got everything necessary to turn wood and metal. And that's going to tie in directly with the foundry. The foundry is going to be able to do everything from brass to bronze to uh, aluminum. Um, maybe if I feel like getting crazy, I'm going to build an oil-fired cupola furnace and be able to do steel or iron. But that's down the road. I need to find some place to actually store that thing. Um, also working on making an internet-enabled weather station. I'm not sure at what point I became heavily interested in meteorology, but I'm fascinated by it now. And I'm looking to build an internet-enabled weather site that people can get the weather from the Black Lodge. That, and I also like the people, I like the idea of people being able to go onto the uh, Weather Underground site and have that as a local station. Because usually they're listed as like local PS13 or such and such school. And I want people to be able to see the Black Lodge and wonder what the hell that is. So, <laughs> Um, and then finally, we had initially thought about doing a 5013C uh, being a nonprofit. I talked to a few folks that run nonprofits, and it seemed like a real pain in the ass. And then lately, I've been talking to Nick and a few other people, and, now, and actually now it seems doable. Uh, we're going to look into doing that um, so we can take advantage of some of the, th some of the benefits that come along with being a, a nonprofit corp. Uh, for example, a number of us work at the same company that actually pays $17 an hour for every hour you volunteer at a nonprofit. Uh, they'll also match donations up to, I think, 12,000 a year. Yeah. So we're thinking, you know, we could leverage that because we're already over there doing public service stuff and it would really help out building some of these projects we want to do. Good timing there. So projects that we've been working on at the Hack Lab, I, I wasn't sure exactly what the setup was going to be, so you're going to have to take my word in describing the, the different pictures. In the upper left, you can see our 35 watt CO2 laser that we got on Craigslist, and it was busted. And a bunch of the members uh, reverse engineered the hardware and replaced all of the control electronics to it, so that um, now we can laser cut stuff. It's pretty pretty awesome. Basically, normally a laser cutter like this is some, would run something on the order of $10,000. We paid 500 bucks plus about 500 bucks for parts for it. So, yeah. <laughs> It was, it was a total steal, and uh, it really was this huge project that the lab worked together on uh, over the course of a couple of weeks just to get it from like completely busted to working in, in a couple of weeks. Um, top middle, you can see our crazy door that has an RFID lock as well as a, uh, a pin pad. You know, you got to have two-factor authentication because those RFID cards are pretty clonable. But uh, we have an open source project called Cer Cer Kerberos Prox. Um, if you go on Google Code, it's all there. Uh, burn your own PCB, or um, I can send you the Gerber files if you need them. Um, and it'll work with the HID prox card 2 clock and data, but it's also, all of the code is open source, so if anybody wants to get other readers working with it, that's totally doable. Um, on the left hand, uh, on the right hand side, uh, there is our toilet, which posts to Twitter when you flush it. Um, <laughs> you can blame Seth for that one, I don't know if he's in the room. Um, bottom middle, uh, Alex, uh, one of our members, designed our logo, and Paul, one of the founders, had a neon sign made out of it, and it looks, t it looks so much more badass in person than it does in that picture. <laughs> and finally, in the bottom right-hand corner, um, this is the jury-rigged connection from the Lisp machine that we had donated to the lab. Um, we were it didn't come with some cables, so we tried to get it working, uh, and we were able to 
figure out the cable connection, but the machine wasn't working, and so it sort of sat in our space and took up space. And as I said, we don't we don't have that much room, so I got I got a lot of crap from other members like get rid of the list machine, get rid of the list machine. And finally, the uh, computer science club at the University of Waterloo was like, oh man, you have a list machine. We'll take it. We'll make it work. So they're they're currently working on uh, getting that repaired and running. And uh, so those are some projects that other people have done, and I've been peripherally involved in some of them. But my project within the lab has been uh, running a drop-in Python class every Thursday. Um, we're using an awesome free and open source textbook, uh, which you can acquire from thinkpython.com. It's called Python for Software Design, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. And it is a fantastic introduction to programming in general, as well as specifically the language Python. The way the class, the way we run the class is we, uh, depending on who shows up on a given week, it's sort of drop in. There isn't really a formal curriculum aside from we're working with this textbook. Um, but we work through whatever point in the text people are comfortable with, or you know, one week we just like hacked on regular expressions for two hours and it was so much fun to see a bunch of people who'd never programmed before except for within this class being like oh man regular expressions this is the coolest thing ever um, and so older students who've been coming to the class for you know a couple of months or ha have showed up a bunch of times over the course of a year uh, will work with newer students and walk them through the first couple of chapters of the textbook um, we'll code together. We usually, when we're running the class, we usually only have one computer out. And so whether it's two people or five people, we'll just either have the code up on a projector or just on an external monitor. And folks will take turns at the keyboard, either reading the text, working through the exercises, and sort of not even just pair programming, but like group programming. And because it's an active class for everyone involved, that's worked really, really well. We haven't figured out how to make a profit off of this yet, but. It's been lots of fun, and that's what's important. Um, lessons learned from the course. Uh, the textbook that we're using is fantastic. I've heard that Noisebridge is using it as well. I definitely recommend it um, as like an introductory programming text. For a weekly drop-in like this, one of the things that we've tr struggled with is that I've been sort of the leader on it and uh, have struggled to sometimes, you know, Sometimes I'm in Las Vegas on Thursday, and what's going to happen to the class? So you know, an email will go, go out to the mailing list. But in case someone who hadn't showed up there before wants to show up, that can make things complicated. So if you want to do a drop-in class like this, I'd definitely recommend having two champions, not just one. And definitely, like it, it is an amazing thing to teach people to, to help folks learn how to code who've never who've thought the programming was inaccessible or something that they couldn't do, whether they're social workers or. Um, we, we have one per, we have a couple of people that come to the class who are completely non techies and ha watching those folks learn how to operate a programming language is just it's it's incredibly rewarding so that's it awesome. all right um, hack DC where we're sort of, in terms of the overall hackerspace, is seen a little bit shy. There are lots of people who are working on a lot of individual projects. I mentioned um, Microcontroller Mondays. A lot of people bring in their projects, share, collaborate, but we're not really, as a hackerspace, engaged in a lot of um, you know hackerspace-wide projects. Aside from trying to fix up our space, trying to bring in more people, trying to work on um, you know our own 501c3 status. But one thing that we are working on that we're really proud of um, is trying to bring free wireless internet um, to our local community. Um, and that's, uh, for anyone who's ever attempted it, no, no small task. Um, the first thing that we did um, for this, uh, actually, is um, just a little bit of a feasibility study and a reality check. That that's always, a lot of wireless projects have come and gone because people tried to bite off way more than they could chew. So. Um, uh, before I introduce that, I strongly believe in free wireless networks. I think that there are, that the digital divide in the country, people who have access to the internet and people who don't have access to the internet, is growing. It was bad before the downturn in the economy, and now it's getting worse. And it should be pretty evident to everybody in the room that people without access to the internet are going to fall even further behind than they already are now. Um, and we should tr try to do what we can to prevent that. When you're thinking about building a free wireless network, which I hope you think about now that a lot of you have hackerspaces, um, is to try to build something that's sustainable. Make sure that whatever you build, and it, really this goes for any project that you do in a hackerspace, make sure that what you're doing is documented so that you can pass it on to somebody else um, when and if you can no longer maintain the project. Um, and always have an eye on building things so that uh, somebody can pick up where you left off or make it better um, uh, with what they know. 
Um, always try to partner you know, with nearby organizations. The first step in our process was partnering with our landlord, um, St. Stephen the Episcopal, or St. Stephen the Incarnation Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C., um, which leased our space. We've completely revamped uh, the internet networking um, and telecommunications infrastructure of the entire building. That was the first step um, in providing free routes to the neighborhood, basically getting the whole church online and getting the church to subsidize the internet connection for all of their tenants, um, and hopefully in the future, the neighborhood at large. Um, and one of the key things about free wireless networking is that you can't just throw it out there and expect people um, to start using it, especially because we're in a uh, generally a split um, lower middle income neighborhood um, and the immediate surrounding property around the church is a Section 8 housing development. Um, we know that we have to build in some kind of mechanism for training, for evangelism, for showing people how to use the internet and providing equipment and creating a channel for providing equipment with other organizations. Um, and another critical thing to think about, uh, that last bullet point, you know, put the wheels on before you reinvent them. If you have a working technology um, that's out there and that's good, use it and try it before you try to, you, you know, build the next greatest, better thing. Um, it's really easy to point out the flaws in any technology, um, but if it works, use it. Uh, the first phase um, is largely done at HackDC right now, just rebuilding um, the infrastructure in the church right now. That's the first part, is just laying down the wires, laying down the groundwork, getting the routers in place, and figuring out where you need to go from here. Um, the funding base, like I said, is actually being created by the church and the tenants. Um, before we rewired the church, everybody in the church, all the various different community organizations, and uh, you know, depending on the time of year, there can be anywhere from nine to 12 different community organizations, was getting their own internet line, getting their own phone line, getting um, all of these things, and duplicating um, you know, a lot of connections where we could have maybe one or two or three um, that were much faster and better at a lower overall cost than getting 12 separate uh, subsidized connections. That's the first part. Um, we replaced a lot of uh, just regular telephone lines with VoIP, um, and then there was other technology that was a part of this project that eliminated the need um, for a daytime guard um, at HackDC. Um, and then a lot of the process of doing this, we got to know our neighbors. We got to not only build um, relationships with them, but get all of the other community organizations to build relationships with each other in the space. And that's, that's another cool thing about doing community technology projects is that you get to reach out to people that you might not otherwise reach out to. They get to know you, and they get to know the people who are involved in building um, your community network. Um, and now that, the, uh, now that the church is largely in line, we're entering the second phase of the project actually putting wireless out in the community. It's, it's suffered a little bit just because um, uh, you know, some of our members who are really active in the project uh, are either underemployed or overemployed, depending on certain things like that. Um, but we are trying to actively work on it, collecting donations and getting things going. Um, we are providing a lot of training and support informally. One of the critical things that we haven't developed yet is a formalized way um, or you know, branching out into another night like we have Microcontroller Mondays, which is pretty well known in the community. We don't have a similar night right now because you know, like Lee pointed out, we don't have a champion or a local person who can take on and saying to anybody in the community, hey, if you stop by on a Thursday night, we'll show you how to build your own computer, how to um, <clears throat> use wireless network, how to do things like that. Um, but really the critical point that's getting us off to the next phase is networking with everybody in our community, getting everybody together, um, and providing people with spare resources, or getting people with spare resources to provide them out to the aggregate community and showing the community how to use them. Um, and w like I said, when we're thinking about sustainability and building things like this into networks, you have to think, well, what happens afterwards? How do we give the people, um, well, once we actually put up this wireless network using various different technologies that are already out there, like the Freyfunk um, hardware uh, for routers that's, for, that works on a bunch of different routers, um, how do we allow people to extend it? And every time we're thinking about network design or building these things, we're thinking about ways where people who have their own router can extend it, can push the network out and beyond, whether they're working with us directly or whether they're not working with us directly. You know, hackers like to play with things that are out there. And we're trying to create a network where people can play with things and at the same time extend the network and branch it out. Um, and as a part of that, we're looking for you know, other people who might not even know we exist in the community, people who are really into technology who might not be subscribed to mailing lists or might not be tremendously social. Um, and one of the things we think is really cool about building this network is the fact that um, 
it's going to be noticed by people who might not know we exist. Um, and I think that's really exciting and awesome. And uh, that's the one big project that we're working on. And like anything, it, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to stay vested in it and keep people excited about it. And, you know, a lot of the maker projects have a very easy payoff, you know, for five or six hours of work or even less than that, you have something that works and blinks and that is doing something. But when you're creating something this large, it's hard to reach a milepost like that that keeps people excited. Um, and when you're approaching a big project like this, you always have to think, in addition to sustainability, in addition to engaging the community, think about different ways that you can keep people, you know, excited and enthusiastic about it because, you know, hackers more so than any other group of people have that short attention span and will move on to something else if you don't keep them interested. And that's all I got. Thanks. No, that's fine. I'll Okay, some of our projects, although we do not have a space, we are uh, very, very busy on our wiki page, which is uh, the main channel we use to communicate with the world, which is a bit of a problem because uh, non-technical people do not understand wiki pages. Uh, they can read them, they barely can edit them, and if they really want to know fast information, a wiki page is not good enough. So we are now thinking of uh, putting up a general info page where, where you get to the info uh, what we are about fast. Um, that's our current logo. Uh, we, we actually had uh, 12 different logos designed, and we even had help from the States, and everyone was giving a, a hand, so uh, we, we had an identity crisis, but it's fixed now. Hopefully that will stay. Um, the bike shed problem wasn't really helping. Um, Okay, basically we try to uh, reuse and just mash up uh, stuff and that's something you can actually explain to, uh, to um, government officials quite easily because sustainability is the new buzzword of these people. So if you tell them, hey, uh, we need a space and sustainability this and we're going to uh, make it a greener tomorrow, they actually listen to you. Uh, so do use the buzzwords. Um, Currently, we are doing quite a lot of awareness raising. Uh, if you go up to someone and you say, hey, I'm a hacker, they're going to be scared for sure. Uh, we abuse that to actually tell them, okay, yes, we are hackers, but if you go and look it up in the dictionary, you will actually know what it means. Um, uh, so don't, don't be scared to, to call yourselves uh, by the name you really are. This is one of the other awareness raising projects. Uh, since the 29th of July, uh, we have um, fingerprints in our passports, which is really, really good, because now all the terrorists are going away from Luxembourg, apparently. <laughs> um, that's what everyone believes, and that's what we are actually fighting for. Uh, most of the people don't know that they have a wireless chip in their pocket, um, so no use to tell them, hey, you have to protect yourself, because they don't even know they, they, they have problems. Um, we have done a press conference together with the Chaos Communication Club in Luxembourg to um, raise awareness that this is not going to solve the problem, that cloning the uh, RFID cards is possible, um, thanks to the RF idiot uh, for that, because otherwise we wouldn't have uh, been able to done it. And yet again, RFID is excellent for cows and stuff, but not really for people. Um, another thing which is really important for us is art and beauty. You, you can actually combine technology with art amazingly. And it's a shame that not more artists out there use technology. It is coming, it's better than in the recent years, but it needs to be more. So we try to actually um, take the, the myths away from uh, electronics, that it's not really that hard to actually get a light blinking or a uh, piezo uh, peeping. Um, to do that, we basically uh, teamed up with one of the museums and we uh, did a public uh, laser tag session. Um, I'll show you a video in a minute uh, about what laser tagging is. Uh, basically, the software is written uh, by uh, Theodore Watson and uh, Zach, and basically, it's it's a great tool to to show how you can combine urban arts with technology. Just giving graffiti artists an alternative to actually destroy buildings. Uh, another thing uh, that we actually did is uh, we uh, used um, the lead throwies for them to, to explore and, and see what actually comes out of it. Um, another technical part about the laser tag software is it was uh, initially written for uh, Mac OS X and uh, Windows, uh, which sucked 
majorly. Uh, we had like 10 frames a second, and if you tell a graffiti artist to uh, paint uh, uh, with 10 frames a second, he's going to kill you. So basically what we did, um, we rewrote it, we ported it to Linux, um, and all of a sudden we had 60 frames a second, which was really sweet. And it works on the standard Ubuntu. Um, later on you can just download it and try it for yourself. Um, we did a summer camp uh, to get all our local hackers together. Uh, we were 20 on that camp, and there were like 15, like 19-year-olds there. It was amazing, and there were like a lot of older people as well, and they were just get, uh, getting along quite nicely. Uh, in the future, we are going to have a local radio show, which is going to be cool. Uh, we just got noticed because of that laser tag session, and they were just uh, asking us, hey, do you want to uh, make a, a radio show? And we said, hey, of course. Um, another thing, uh, youth is very important for us. We try to focus uh, on uh, U23 workshops where we uh, just try and give the, the youngsters the respect you need to actually work in a hackerspace. Uh, we inspired ourselves from the uh, San Francisco hackerspace no noise bridge and just said, okay, let's be excellent to each other and let's respect the $10,000 um, piece of kit in the same way as you would actually just uh, play with a $2 uh, microchip controller, which is very, very important. Um, because we, without youth, responsible youth, there will be no future for hackers. And I am noticing uh, uh, it's getting quite old in here as well. So also for you guys, come on, bring the kids on. <laughs> And this is the video from uh, the laser tag session. What I actually forgot to mention is we, we founded the Graffiti Research Lab Luxembourg um, just especially for that to actually combine the technology uh, with the arts and they are incorporated in uh, our future hackerspace. Um, currently we are actually looking uh, at a new place. Uh, it's going to be a 100 square meter uh, container that used to be a school. Uh, so basically it's fully equipped with, with everything you just need, but we still need to convince the commune that uh, we are the right guys. They've been telling us for two months now that we're gonna get it. The problem is, if you do anything, uh, spoken word is nice, but just get it on paper to make sure, because otherwise they'll, they'll bullshit with you um, in, ad infinitum, so yeah. That's all from us, thank you very much. Right. Well, we're running a few minutes long, so if you do want to chat with us, please come to Capri 106 after the talk. Uh, I just want to sum it up a little bit. Uh, you can join or build a hackerspace in your community. Hackerspaces.org will help point you uh, in the right direction and give you a lot of resources and a mailing list to uh, post questions to or collaborate with others. Um, Please support hackerspaces in your community if you find them and or build them. Uh, they're as different as the people who are involved in them, as you can see, and this is only a small sampling. Um, and you know, as far as the different projects they're involved in and the different philosophies of each group and or lack thereof. Uh, 
and just know that building and maintaining a hackerspace is a fun project in itself. Here's some resources for y'all. Does anybody have any questions? Amish, do we, do we have a mic, Amish? We did this at the beginning, but everybody who is involved in their local hacker space, please raise a hand. Right on. <laughs> I have a public service announcement uh, while we're waiting for questions. Makers Local 256, which is in Huntsville, Alabama, is hosting a makers meetup, and everyone is invited who is interested in, in making a hacker space or is currently involved in one. It's September 18th to 20th this year, and if you would like to keep up with that, sign up for the hackerspaces.org mailing list and or annoy Lady Merlin. All right. Anybody else? As a matter of fact. Nick? Do you want to say what he's talking about, Nick? Um, I, I, th I, I think Heaven Sent hasn't officially de-embargoed that yet. Um, it's up on... <laughs> 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 like the bees? <laughs> I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> and, 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 and I just want to make sure that, that it's not supposed to be out yet, so I'm, I'm going to actually err on the side of caution on this one. And, and actually create more buzz so that people are going to frantically try to figure out what exactly it is that we're talking about and frantically go through While all we're trying to figure that out, does anyone else have other questions? That guy over there. Mm -hmm. Dude, come, come up here. Oh, well, I, I think you, your, your question was, have you... Have you had a hackerspace where you've had a core group that's lost interest and in how you've succeeded and overcome that? Okay, that's exactly what happened with Hack DC, the core group that started Thanks. it. I, I'm the only person left in that core group that's peripherally involved. But the thing, but like I said earlier about building sustainability, the idea was from the very beginning that the people who started the hackerspace, and I strongly encourage everybody who's starting a hackerspace to think about the next generation and to try to give over a lot of the leadership and to try to give over a lot of the sort of administrative day-to-day -day control and to teach people from the very get-go how to run the hackerspace. And I'm, I'm very grateful that that happened at Hack DC, that we wrote, the founders wrote themselves out of um, the succession tree there. And right now Hack DC is being run by people who were not there at the beginning. And they're doing a much better job than we were doing at the beginning. And that that's absolutely essential that if you're going to start it, always be thinking about when you're going to turn it over and try to turn it over as soon as possible to people. Because then that's going to build a culture where that group is going to turn it over to the next group and you're creating that sustainability. You know, people come in and come out and the sign of a healthy hacker space is one where there is a lot of turnover. And, and so I, I think that's a great question. I, anybody else have experience? I do too. I would like to add to that. Even though our hacker space is brand new, one of our um, founding members is leaving. And in fact, he had been in the leadership position in our space. And so uh, one of our focuses has been to build it for survivability. Um, just like, you know, a startup where the founders want the company to, you know, mature and grow after they leave, it's the same thing. You have to plan for it from the ground up and or, you know, I guess it, if it happened and you didn't plan for it, I, I think those, they fail. I think that that's what happens. So you have to be conscious of that. It can't be a cult of personality. Uh, it has to be a, a real uh, collaborative effort and you have to involve everyone. And on that note, we just got the big X, so uh, we're going to be moving to the um, set track one, Capri 106, uh, breakout room, if you guys, want, guys and girls want to continue talking shop about hackerspaces.